All right, so it's been a couple of weeks since we did a video looking at public opinion polls, and the last time that we did this, Kamala Harris was still riding high when it comes to her favorability and national polling, in part thanks to her performance at the debate. But since then, there has been quite the big vibe shift. Now, I told you all the last time that we would revisit polling data after the vice presidential debate to determine whether or not that would move the needle, and as you all probably know by now, it did not. But little by little, polls have continued to tighten, which is to be expected as we move closer to Election Day. But with less than three weeks to go, where does the race stand right now? When you look at aggregate polling data from 538, Kamala Harris's national lead is about the same. And when we last looked at the numbers on September 25th, she was sitting at 2.4 percent. So she did grow her lead by a tenth of a percentage point, but not significant enough to really make any broad statements about that. As for Real Clear Politics polling averages, her national average currently sits at 1.7 points. It was 2.1 points the last time that we checked on September 25th. And for comparison's sake, Hillary Clinton had a 5.5 percent national lead at this time in 2016, and Biden had an 8.9 point lead in 2020. By election day, Clinton's average lead shrunk to 2.1 points, and Biden's lead shrunk to 4.5 points on election day in 2020. And if history is any indication, odds are the polls will tighten even more as we move closer to election day, which is pretty alarming, honestly, because Hillary Clinton had a higher national lead in 2016 at this point in the race than Kamala has right now. And Hillary went on to lose that election, even though she did end up winning the popular vote. But to be fair, national polls don't really matter at this point in the race. What really matters is where things are at in key swing states. So where do they stand for Kamala Harris and Donald Trump right now? In Arizona, Trump is ahead on average by more than a point, and he's consistently pulling ahead in individual polls, including the New York Times, which is a reputable pollster that puts Trump ahead by five points, which is not great. In Nevada, Trump has retaken the lead in large part due to a six point bump he got from a Wall Street Journal poll. So that's kind of skewing the average. But every other pollster found that it's a really tight race in Nevada. In Wisconsin, Trump has essentially erased Harris's lead and she's now got a 0.3 percent advantage. But for all intents and purposes, this is a tie. In Michigan, Trump has not only erased Harris's lead, he's taken the lead overall and now has a one point advantage over her in a state where she has consistently performed better than him on average, even though it's still pretty close. Now, in the must win state of Pennsylvania, this is where the alarm bells start to go off. They're both effectively tied. Trump has a 0.3% advantage, but the silver lining is that the New York Times has her at plus three, so not all hope is lost in Pennsylvania, but it is a little bit too close for comfort. In North Carolina, Harris had effectively erased Trump's lead, but he's managed to now claw his way back to the top. Although to be clear, his lead is still within the margin of error, as is the case in every other swing state. And last but not least, when it comes to Georgia, Trump narrowly leads by about a point. Now, the last time we looked at swing state polling data on September 25th, they were both still effectively tied, but Harris did hang on to narrow leads in states like Michigan and Pennsylvania. And even though it hasn't changed that much, comparatively speaking, it's still incrementally shifting in Trump's direction. It's a small shift, but it's still a shift nonetheless. And if this trend holds, he could outright take the lead in some of these states by election day. Now, if you juxtapose today's swing state averages to swing state averages from 2020 and 2016, at this same point in the election, you begin to get a sense that Kamala Harris may actually be in trouble. Matt Margolis, who is a Republican number cruncher, created this graphic to illustrate where the 2024 race sits compared to 2020 and 2016. And these are just numbers from Real Clear Politics that he's plugging in here. So this is legitimate, even though it's a Republican sharing them, just rest assured. But in Wisconsin, Harris sits at 0.3, whereas Biden was 6.3 points ahead and Hillary was six points ahead. Biden ended up winning by 0.06%, a difference of less than 21,000 votes, while Hillary lost by 0.7%, a difference of about 23,000 votes. In Pennsylvania, Harris has a 0.3% lead, whereas Biden had a 5.6 point lead and Clinton had a seven point lead. As you all know, Biden went on to win, but he won by 1.2 points, whereas Clinton went on to lose by 0.7%. Jumping down to Michigan, Harris is behind by a point, whereas Biden was up by 7.2 points points, and Hillary was up by 11.4 points at the same point in the race. Biden went on to win by 2.8 points, and Hillary went on to lose by 0.3%. So if the last two presidential elections were an indication of what to expect, where Donald Trump ended up overperforming polls, 
then it logically follows that Trump is probably going to do better in swing states this time than the polls indicate. But the caveat is that the polls in 2016 were off by a lot, even though the national result was fairly accurate. And even though the polls were more accurate in 2020, they still did underestimate Donald Trump in large part because he tends to bring out non-traditional voters who aren't measured by these polls. But if you look at the 2022 election, however, the opposite happened, where Democrats were underestimated, and in 2024, new registrations among Democrats surpassed new Republican voter registrations at certain points in the race. So the question is, will we see that again, and can you compare a midterm election to a presidential election? And it's really hard to say. And None of these new voters are going to be picked up by the polls, but the question is whether or not new registrations for Democrats outpace new registrations for Republicans in a significant enough way to create a huge discrepancy between current polling and the outcome. And I think it's possible. More women are fired up than ever over the issue of abortion. The polls reflect that as well. And abortion ballot initiatives in states like Nevada and Arizona could benefit Harris, but we won't actually know until we see the results. But I will say, I'm ambivalent about this point because, well, as The Hill reports, Democrats' voter registration advantage has dropped in three key battleground states, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Nevada, raising a red flag for Vice President Harris as experts cite a lack of enthusiasm for the Biden administration brand and the Democratic Party generally as problems. Quote, if you look at the changes from 2020 to 2024, Democrats are down about 300,000 voters and Republicans are up about 70,000. Non-affiliated independent voters are up about 83,000, 85,000 voters, said Burwood Yost, director of the Center for Opinion Research at Franklin and Marshall College in Pennsylvania. In other words, I'm not holding my breath that new voter registrations are going to save Harris because even if there was a point where there were more new voter registrations for Democrats. Overall, if you step back and see that Republicans have more, well, then that's not really going to make a difference. And another question is, can Harris get those people who registered to actually vote and not just register and then do nothing with said registration, right? But there is another caveat to consider when it comes to this question as to whether or not polls are underestimating Democrats, as was the case in 2022. And it's the question of whether or not junk right-wing pollsters are flooding averages and skewing them to create this impression that the race is closer than it really is. Now, I will admit that there are a lot of junk polls out there, and if you average them all out, it does clearly signal a drop in support for Harris. But I have two problems with this argument. First and foremost, it's contingent on copious amounts of copium and wishful thinking, to be to be frank. And second of all, if you move away from averages and you just zero in on a couple of reputable pollsters and you look at the trends that they've picked up over time, they've essentially produced the same result as aggregate polling data. Has. Take NBC News's poll, for example. The five point advantage that Kamala Harris had in our last poll is gone. What's behind that shift? Yeah, exactly, Savannah. I mean, just look at them side by side and you can see it. Remember that poll we took a month ago that you see here? It was just after that first Trump Harris debate. Since then, we've had the VP debate. There have been some campaign activity, some interviews, some things that have changed in that time. I think this might be the biggest for Harris. We just asked the basic image perception people have is it positive or negative of these candidates? The Trump number's always been somewhere in this territory. In fact, this is a little bit high for him, believe it or not, 43% positive. But look at Harris, 43 positive, 49 negative. The significance, we polled this a month ago. She was 48% positive and 45 negative. She was above water, as they say. That's completely reversed. It now looks very similar to Trump's. That's a pretty big shift when you're talking about a race this close. And then there's the weight of the fact she's the VP in an unpopular administration. Administration. We asked about President Biden's policies. Are they helping or hurting your family? Just a quarter of voters said they're helping. Nearly half said they're hurting. And then here's the interesting twist. We also asked folks, think back to when Donald Trump was president. Did his policies help or hurt your family? And look at the difference. 44 percent helping, 31 hurting. Trump's the, the retrospective, you would say, opinion of Trump's presidency among voters, arguably higher now than when he was president. So this is a trend discovered by just one pollster. But if you disregard the junk polls and polling averages and you just look at a couple of A-rated pollsters or reputable pollsters that are more trustworthy with better track records, then 
have they tracked the same trend that aggregate polling data is showing us? Well, if you look at CBS polling data over time, she peaked in September and she dropped by a point in the last poll that they conducted. When it comes to morning consult, she also peaked in September and has since dropped by two points in their latest poll. In the New York Times Siena College poll, she was underwater until peaking in mid-September like the other polls and has since dropped by a point. On the other hand, Marist, which is another highly rated pollster, they actually tracked the opposite trend. So in their last poll conducted between October 8th through the 10th, she actually had her highest national lead yet, at least according to them. But with the exception of Marist, more reliable pollsters are mapping the same downward trend for Harris that we're seeing when it comes to aggregate polling data, at least at the national level. Although the caveat is that real clear politics shows her going down because they do include more right-wing junk pollsters, whereas 538 is saying mm, her lead only decreased by a tenth of a percentage point. So take from that what you will. Now, again, we're talking about national polling here, which is just an indication of who's going to win the popular vote, not the electoral college. But I do still think that the national vote can be useful to spot trends and see if those trends hold true in swing states. And when it comes to a general decrease for Harris, it does seem to be pretty consistent. Many pollsters are showing that she has gone down since September when she peaked. Now, again, we're talking about very, very small changes in the aggregate, but when the election is so close, the smallest change the most minuscule shift in either direction could drastically change this election's outcome. So I want to watch CNN data analyst Harry Anten. He's going to break down what's happening here at the swing state level in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. And some of what he says is going to be redundant. We already talked about it, but nonetheless, I do think it's still worth watching because his insight here is very valuable. These are, of course, the Great Lake battleground states, the states we've been focusing in on. If Kamala Harris wins these three, she most likely gets to 270 electoral votes. Take a look three weeks ago. Harris was ahead by two in Pennsylvania, two in Wisconsin, three in Michigan. Look at where we are today. The race is even tighter, even tighter than it was. Today, it's a one-point advantage in Pennsylvania, one in Wisconsin, one in Michigan. Look, that's limited movement. But in a year in which this race has been so static, if we're talking one-point movement, one-point movement, two-point movements, and we see movements in all three, this is the type of thing that at least in the public polling makes Democrats worry. And I think that the public polling in this case is reflected in some of that internal polling, some of that reporting that suggests that these Great Lake battleground states have certainly tightened a lot, where at this point they are way too close to call. It is what you call a trend. It is when a you trend. See something like this over several states. When you compare this to, to, to four years ago, what does it look like? Yeah, so let's take a look and we're going to look at an average across these three states, right? Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. An average on October 11th, what do you see? Well, if you look eight years ago, Hillary Clinton was way out in front in an average of these three. She was up by eight. You go four years ago, Joe Biden was up by an average of seven points across these three Great Lake battleground states. You come today, it's just a one-point advantage for Kamala Harris across these three Great Lake battleground states. So Kamala Harris, at least in the polling, is doing considerably worse than Biden or Clinton. And of course, Clinton lost in all three of these states, and Joe Biden barely won in all three of these states. So when you see Harris up by just a point across these three, I think that this is really the type of thing that gets Democrats really to worry, John, because the simple fact is Kamala Harris is doing considerably worse than either Biden or Clinton was. Yeah. So uh, the trend is real, and the reality could be even more bleak because Michigan Democrat and Senate candidate Elisa Slotkin told donors that Harris is underwater in Michigan, according to her internal polling data. Now, look, I've been pretty bullish in all of these polling videos, and I've maintained that you probably shouldn't panic if I'm not panicking because I'm almost always in doomer mode. So the question is, am I starting to panic? The answer is yes, I am. Kamala Harris is now losing in all but one swing state, and it's close, but nonetheless shifting in the wrong direction. So I think it's officially time to panic, and I am now worried. It doesn't mean that she's definitely going to lose because it's still way too close, but it shouldn't be this close, right? The question is, why is Harris declining if the polling data is actually true and she's not being underrepresented? And I think that the obvious answer is that she's blowing it. 
It's the election that she's running. She squandered the goodwill that she built up with progressives and the Democratic Party's base by just running too far to the right on issues like immigration, fracking, foreign po foreign policy, and support for Israel's genocide in Gaza. But most importantly, she is destroying her chances among regular voters by refusing to distance herself from Biden. That is what I think is really hurting her as evidenced by the NBC poll that Steve Kornacki talked about. Biden is a deeply unpopular lame duck president, and her baffling willingness to tie herself to him is one of the worst campaign decisions I have ever seen. It's like she's tying a cinder block to her leg and jumping in the water. It makes no sense. On The View, she said that she couldn't think about how she'd be different than Biden, aside from appointing a Republican to her administration. And shortly after that, on Colbert's show, she basically said the same thing and said she'd be different than Joe Biden because she's not Joe Biden and she's also not Donald Trump, which is not the answer voters are looking for because they want her to significantly break from him on policy. But she just hasn't done that in any meaningful way. She's split from him around the edges, but for the most part, what she's doing by campaigning as Biden 2.0, it is killing her campaign. Now, she's done some very good things to try to win back the Democratic Party's progressive base that has been very demoralized since her right-wing pivot at the DNC. She introduced long-term care for Medicare. That's great. More of that, though. You can't just introduce that and then walk away from it. You need to talk about it. You need to bring up more policies that you would do that are different from Biden. And I think that part of the problem going back to this issue of whether or not she wants to break from Biden is that she doesn't want to do that because she doesn't want to be disloyal to Biden because she expects absolute fealty from her vice president if she's elected. She wouldn't want Tim Walls to break from her. The problem is that if she doesn't do that, she's not going to be president and won't have a vice president to be disloyal in the first place. I think that being president and having a disloyal VP is better than not being president, don't you think? And Tim Walls is not going to be disloyal. Now, even though, you know, uh, she's refusing to throw Joe Biden under a bus and it's hurting her, even with all that being said, flaws aside, still, the election should not be this close given the alternative. But a lot of Americans, for better or worse, they're not looking at this as Trump being a threat to democracy or our civil rights and civil liberties. They're thinking about who to blame for their economic woes. And Americans aren't doing good economically. And since that's the case, they're going to base their votes on this belief that they were better off under Donald Trump than they are now, even though things weren't great under Donald Trump. Now, since they feel uneasy about their financial situation, they're placing blame on Biden since he is the incumbent. Hence why Kamala is now losing as she is associated with Biden more directly. And her refusal to distance herself from Biden is tantamount to her jumping on a gr grenade for Biden. Don't do it. Move away from Biden, throw him, uh, throw him under a bus, tell him to fuck off on national television. Like you, ha you have to, and I'm being hyperbolic obviously, but you can't keep being Biden 2.0. She has to drastically distance herself from Biden and fast to turn things around. I get that there's only so much that she can do to distance herself from him since he's the president and she's the VP, but she's got to make an effort. She's got to at least make an effort. Otherwise, she could very well lose this election. Now, the good news is that the campaign knows they're in danger and they're starting to switch it up. They've got Tim Walls on the stump more and Kamala's doing more interviews. Again, she introduced that progressive policy, long-term care for Medicare. Awesome. This is good, but this will all result in no change if she continues to be Biden 2.0. She needs to, in these interviews that she's doing, consistently outline the differences between her and Biden on policy issues. And she needs to speak to the real economic anxiety that Americans are feeling. And if she gives enough voters the confidence that she will be different and better than Biden on the economy, then I think that she can still eke out a victory. But I will leave you with one piece of hopium. Even though Kamala is not running a very good campaign, I think she was running a great campaign at the start, but then she started to listen too much to Democratic Party strategists and advisors, and it all just kind of went downhill. But even though I have a lot of disagreements with the campaign she's running, Trump is by far and away running the worst presidential campaign in the history of American politics. It is shocking some of the decisions that he's making. He's becoming more unhinged and untethered from reality as time goes on, and it's hurting him with average Americans, not to mention his election denialism, which hasn't stopped. So at this point in time, the race is a toss-up. 
As Nate Silver put it, it's literally 50-50. And even though I have my disagreements with Nate Silver, I do agree with that assessment, although he does note some movement towards Donald Trump in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, which could improve Trump's odds of winning. So maybe it's not going to be 50-50 for long. We don't know. But as of right now, it is a very very close race. And even though the election is weeks away, a lot can still change between now and November 5th. So buckle up because we are going to be in for a wild ride, even if Kamala Harris does pull off a victory, because we all know Trump isn't going to go down without another coup attempt. So mentally prepare yourself for the shit show that is about to ensue and enjoy the relative peace while we still have it. You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? tree, tree, tree. Tree. <laughs> Tree. They not like us. Tree. Tree. You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? Tree. <laughs>